Um, good, good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for coming, and thanks for. We've got some special guests from the AA, so that's very nice. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, it's really nice to welcome back Sho, who um, he was teaching here, but then he, he enjoyed it so much he, he left. He jumped ship, um, and but he's come back. No hard feelings, and. He's also working, uh, amongst other things, I'm sure he'll tell you what he's been doing, but he's, he's working with a couple of uh, former students here, so says Azam and Lorenzo, which is very nice to see this evening. Um, and show was a great, he was a fantastic tutor here, an incredible, uh, sort of, incredibly, it sort of encouraged students in a way that uh, doesn't always happen sometimes in un undergraduate teaching. And, uh, so, and he had a kind of another level of expectation, which was really, uh, really good for the school. And um, so I hope we can continue that spirit. But it's very nice to invite you back. So shows an architect. Um, he's getting involved in all sorts of other funny building projects. He is also a technical tutor. Thank you very good. That's very much. He was much respect to technical tutors. Um, he teach uh, the AA um, in years one, three, and five. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, you're pretty busy. Um, but anyway, thanks very much, and you're very welcome back, and I hope we can get you, invite you back on a more regular basis, either as a critic or yes. lecturer, but <laughs> thank, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you very much, Will. Um, it's kind of a really nice comment to hear. Uh, so yeah, I taught here for three years, so it's kind of nice to be back. It's nice to see some familiar faces, some ex-students, some current students. Um, so thank you very much for making the time, because I understand next week is quite busy for a lot of Westminster students and AA students, and if there's any other university students here. So thank you very much for making the time. Um, it means a lot to me. So as the title suggests, I would like to talk about nature's treasures. And what that means in the context of today's lecture is natural resources on Earth, like coal, like timber, water, and oil, which are vital for us to live the way we live, and really all the benefits that we actually have as human beings. And why I want to talk about this is because there is a strong link to the climate crisis with the practice of over-extraction and over-utilization of natural hu resources by humans. And tonight, I would like to specifically talk about sand, because sand is the second most extracted natural resource on Earth that has direct spatial implications to the way we live. So as a start, why should we even care about natural resources? So I think we all own a smartphone now, and this presentation by Steve Jobs in 2007 was mind-blowing at the time. Um, for those who are old enough to see it live. So I'm not sure if, <laughs> if there's enough people here that saw it live. Um, and before smartphones, for some, it might be quite nostalgic. Uh, the Nokias and the Motorola's, these kind of flip phones, and you can change the case, you can make it kind of transparent, and it was kind of strong enough that you can throw it and it wouldn't break. So to make these ancient phones and also your iPhones that are inseparable to all of us, uh, and also the house we live in, the food we eat, the clothes we wear, essentially everything in existence is linked to these resources that underpin our daily needs. So what this inherently means is that it has a spatial, it has an architectural implication to the human habitation, and it's kind of across multiple scales from the geographical to the territorial to the room. And the concern that I'm trying to raise here is the unprecedented rate and scale of the practice. And it's not likely to stop, as the kind of film suggests, economics has always, always been a driving factor until it crashes, obviously. And there is too much money involved to visualize the long-term damage over short-term finance. So 
Extraction of oil is quite a good example. We've seen this year many protests by students from UCL, Oxford, and Nottingham uh, throwing orange paints to protest um, about the additional licenses that the UK government has issued. It is a very lucrative business, um, and it nurtures multi-billion dollar companies like BP, like Shell, and Chevron. And this is no different to coal mining operations. The high return will not stop any capitalistic corporation that has kind of a sane mind. And here you have then Prime Minister Scott Morrison. In 2018, he famously praised coal's value in a parliamentary debate around the topic of renewable energy, which is totally crazy because we all know that you know, it's the pinnacle of a non-renewable you know, material, which shows Australia's dependency on coal. In UK, Margaret Thatcher established the 1989 Water Act and sold off the last remaining water uh, industry. And this was publicly owned. And we all love Coke. I love Coke. For those who know me, I drink a lot of Coke. But to make one liter of Coke, you need four liters. So companies like Coca-Cola, Nestle, Spring Valley, they extract large quantities of this seemingly common resource and exploit the global south till they run dry. And now the richest person in China isn't Jack Ma, who was the CEO of Alibaba, or CEO of TikTok owner, but Zong Shanshan, who's literally filling up bottles of water and selling it. And obviously, being the richest man in China just by selling bottles of water is, is, means, means something, right? So I'm not obviously trying to advocate an extreme opposite way of living or telling you here not to use any resource or not to do anything like that, but I think the conversation and dialogue that I'm trying to generate and bring awareness is balance. So how can we balance the delicate relationship between economic development and being responsible for our own planet's resource. So this is a crude simplification, as it's obviously much more complex than what I'm about to state. But I think just come along with me. Almost all of natural phenomenon that is increasingly occurring across the globe is caused by the over-extraction and over-utilization of natural resources for human needs. And the implication of this is upsetting the balance of the ecosystem, causing bushfires, floods, hurricanes, volcano eruptions, cyclones, and many more. So you're probably thinking, why is an architect talking about this? Why is an academic talking about this? And not a geologist or environmentalist or an activist. So, I guess because it has direct implication to the way we live. Hopefully you know this building, Fansworth House by Mies, provided provision for flood risks. Therefore, it's elevated off the ground, obviously. But the worst case scenario is fluctuating at a rapid pace. It's becoming far more unpredictable and far more inconsistent. And the result is quite detrimental here. Architecture is not about designing in isolation, but to variables and contingencies that the earth creates. And this is happening not just to the house scale, but entire cities forced to relocate, like Jakarta in Indonesia, as families are displaced in a completely new environment. And we understand this space through different platforms, which highlights the danger, as we hear from professors and specialists from universities and NGOs, we hear from authors and activists, and even individuals from Hollywood, like you know, in the center, Leonardo DiCaprio. And this has obviously helped to nurture collectives, groups, and associations to actively contribute to the discussions. And although slowly, quite, quite slowly, we witness more news, we witness more conversations that centers their dialogue around these immediate issues. So in light of this, I want to delve into one resource which proportionally gets much less media attention and relevant to architecture students and the profession. Sand, which sounds quite underwhelming. <laughs> and you're probably thinking, why? <laughs> There's probably plenty of sand. And in somewhat sense, it's true. 
we have always used sand as an analogy of the infinite, the limitless, and incapable of exhaustion. Scientists estimate there is 7.5 sextillion grains of sand. And to give you a rough scale of what that means architecturally, that is enough to fill 3 billion Olympic-sized swimming pool. So that's, again, quite hard to imagine. But the point is that there seems to be plenty of sand, or at least sound like there is plenty. However, the misconception is that, as mentioned earlier, sand is the second most extracted natural resource on Earth after water. And it's literally used everywhere. So construction is the most obvious one. However, other less known industry is like fashion. So the stretchy fabrics that you guys are all wearing, that's made out of sand. Sand is used in the microchips, phone screen, computer screens. Sand is used to make all the essential parts of the cars and trains and planes we ride on. It's obviously used in agriculture. It's also used in fracking, where sand is used to blast the groundwork to dig deeper. Sand is used in paint. Sand is used in toothpaste. So literally everywhere, it's hard not to find something that doesn't use sand in one way or another. However, tonight I will be discussing sand use for construction purposes, as obviously it proportionally has much more impact than other industries. So looking back, historically the use of sand has always existed in human civilization. This photo shows a remain of an ancient settlement in Turkey and the use of sand to make bricks as early as 7,000 BC. It was documented that Egyptians in 3,500 BC used sand within their construction process. But I think more interestingly and notably was the first to use sand intentionally to produce juries and beads by melting sand. So what this indicates is that sand has always been an important resource. However, there was no detrimental, I guess, concern or issue at the time due to the scale of these operations. But this radically changed from the 20th century. So this diagram illustrates the world population and growth rate. And you can see the steep curvature from the 1900s. So to paint you a picture, it took 200,000 years of modern human history to reach 1 billion in population in 1805. It reached 2 billion in 1925. And then by 2008, so one year after Steve Jobs saying, here's my Apple phone, it reached 6 billion people. And now only 15 years after 2008, it's reached 8 billion, and it's predicted to be close to 10 billion people by 2050. So what this obviously means is, naturally, we need more homes. We need more infrastructure. Therefore, construction had to significantly expand in the 20th century. So unfortunately, at present, it's not possible to accurately monitor global sand use. However, the correlation between the use of sand in relation to cement is thought to be a good indicator. So this means for construction alone, so only construction, the world consumes roughly 50 billion tons of sand on an annual basis. And what that means spatially or architecturally, that is enough to build a 30 meter wall, so about 10, kind of 10 floors, which is 30 meters wide, that wraps around the entire planet once a year. So that, that's quite scary if you think about it in terms of a kind of spatial kind of context. And in terms of individual scale, according to the UN, the global demand of sand is around 18 kilogram per person per day, which is quite alarming and far exceeds the natural rate at which sand is being replenished by the weathering of rocks, by wind and water. And really, um, the concern is the unprecedented population growth in urban areas. So we're not really worried about the rural areas, but it's the urban areas that's kind of causing a lot of concern. The number of people living or moving to urban area has more than quadrupled since 1950. Here you can see 
how Hong Kong's peninsula completely transformed and changed in the last 50 years. From what was a low rise, kind of countryside picturesque, one could say, to what we know of Hong Kong as today, um, a big concrete jungle. Here's a diagram that visually demonstrates how China has used over three times more cement in the last 10 years. So 10 years compared to America in the last 115 years. And at the back for scale comparison, that would be the size of Great Pyramid of Giza, which is 147. So visually, it, it's, it's quite kind of astonishing when you can see it, um, how much China has been constructing in the last kind of good 10 years. And here's the map of China, the third biggest country in surface area. And if we take into account the last 17 years, China has used enough cement to cover their entire floor area or surface area with a meter layer of cement. Again, quite scary. And this becomes problematic as countries like India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Vietnam, and majority of the Southeast Asian countries are following the same population growth and economic trajectory as China. This diagram shows how many Southeast Asian cities like Jakarta, Manila, Bangkok, Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh City's household earning growth by 2030, meaning again, more housing that needs to be paired with educational, commercial, and governmental facilities. So as you can imagine, more sand. Therefore, sand extraction is only going to accelerate in the next 15 to 20 to 30 years, making sand an underrated and underappreciated commodity that's essentially quite embedded into our lives. Therefore, it's not ridiculous to say that our civilization, our society, is literally made out of sand. And I guess what makes this issue um, I guess less media worthy is that if you look around the world, one third of the earth is desert. So, so you think, why? Well, what's the problem? And this can be understood by looking at the Burj Khalifa. I had a chance to capitalize my 21 hour kind of uh, transfer time before heading to Australia, I think two or three years ago, and popped to see this tallest tower in the world. Um, it was quite astonishing actually, the sheer scale of it. And obviously to build this 830 meter tower, a substantial amount of concrete was required. And to make concrete, you need sand. And due to the geographical location, where the land is very soft because it's kind of surrounded by deserts and sand, and in addition, sandstorms that can reach 100 kilometers per hour meant that the foundation thickness and form needed to be designed to provide kind of obviously strength to withstand the load of the building. So essentially, it doesn't sink. And the number of piling was increased and designed much deeper than typical depths located strategically to counter any wind loads. So as I mentioned, sand is the most important component making concrete in construction. Dubai, if, everyone, if anyone's gone, is obviously surrounded by the desert. So there's plenty of sand, and it's really this misconception that is causing the lack of urgency the lack of exposure of this crisis. So not all sand is useful. So sand that's most extractable and most abundant is sand from the desert. But the sand from the desert is too fine, it's too soft from the wind erosion to be practical in any kind of construction industry. Therefore, it's obviously completely left untouched meaning many of the construction in Dubai, like the Burj Khalifa, relied on sand being imported at times all the way from Australia, which is about 10,000 kilometers away. So you can imagine how ridiculous that is to kind of build this construction. Sand that is useful is sand found on beaches, riverbeds, and under the sea. Essentially because the particles that you can find in these conditions are rough and uneven supporting the binding to each other when you're kind of making concrete, essentially. Which is exactly why we are running out of sand, 
sand found in these particular locations are not limitless. So I'll use Lake Pongyang in China as a case study to show how human intervention can have geographical implications. A recent study estimates that 236 million cubic meters of sand is taken out of this lake annually, which makes it the biggest sand mine on the entire planet. And it's far bigger than the three largest US sand mines combined. So, you know, that, that's quite big. And geographically, it is situated below the Yangtze River and diagonally from Shanghai. And majority of the sand extracted in Lake Pongyang was used to make the construction for Shanghai and the peripheral cities in the last 20 years. So here you can see satellite images from 2000 and 2023. And you can really observe the observed kind of like, I guess, how the geometry has changed along the edges. So 2000 being very crisp and clear, and by 2023, it's essentially become like a gradient or blurred between the edges. And zooming in a bit, in 1997 on the left and 2019 on the right, you can see and observe large portions of sand being extracted and completely kind of eaten and chewed away along the meanders and bends. So if we zoom in a little bit more. And this condition is seen in many rivers, lakes, shorelines, in many different countries, which is why it's actually quite concerning. Further zooming right in, you can see the scale of the sand mining operations. So in this highlighted area, we have three dredges and 15 vessels, ranging from about 15 to 40 meters, waiting to be filled up. So you can, I guess, visually see how they're scooping up the sand from the edges, completely transforming, mutating these boundaries. Here, the yellow hatching shows the missing land. And ultimately, when you remove or kind of take the sand away, it changes the current speed, the direction, the velocity, the capacity of the water. Um, and what it does is obviously it causes sporadic floods in areas that never had floods or sudden droughts on agricultural land that always had consistent water flow. And it's reported that there may be over 100 dredges and vessels on a given day. And I guess compared to other natural resources like coal and oil, where there needs to be substantial initial investments to construct infrastructure, to construct systems and procedures that are location fixed, meaning a lot of the management of this is done by large corporations who are required to obtain licenses from governments to be able to do this. However, sand extraction is much more cost efficient without the need of large scale infrastructure and is, is very flexible to the location, making it prone for illegal activity. So here's a photo where Chinese sand dredgers was obtained and detained by the Coast Guard and forced to pump sand back into the beach it stole it from. So pragmatically, how does it work? Basically, all you need is a sand dredger and uh, it needs to have a cutter head. And this cutter head is submerged into the seabed and it kind of rips and cuts everything in along the bed and kind of like a blender while sucking up the sand. And then this is collected in the loading space and then potentially transported to other locations for building material. So it, it's really a primitive and quite simple operation, which is why it's happening at an alarming rate. So again, you can see how scary and concerning this is by seeing how many dredges and vessels are just waiting along the kind of lake and easily kind of relocatable if kind of uh, Coast Guards come. Here you can see sections at three different locations. And for comparison, one at 1998 and one at 2013.
So if we take section A, you can see the substantial change that has been inflicted to the riverbed. And when you're literally digging up the bed, you're essentially killing all the current marine life and any obviously future marine life. Um, because areas that didn't get dug up essentially still ends up dying because of the murky water and all the sand that covers what's left of the marine vegetation, completely suffocating it and killing it slowly. So zooming up on section C, um, again, you can really see how the seabed is completely kind of transformed. And as with nature, it's, it's all interconnected, right? If there is no marine vegetation, the water is not naturally cleaned. Then there's no plankton, then there's no fishes, and then there's no birds, obviously. And what's actually quite concerning about the information I'm showing you is that this is a condition in 2013. And the construction boom in China occurred and kept going until the COVID year, which is around 2020. So there is strong assumptions that the riverbed is in far worse condition than what I'm actually showing to you right now. And similar scale of operation is occurring internationally. For example, the Da Dang River in Vietnam, where bends were artificially destroyed and distorted and farmers' land completely flooded, forcing them to relocate. In India, the extraction has weakened the soil condition and the foundation of the bridges, making it unstable, resulting it to failure. Along coastline in India, you can see the transformation from 2003, which is down there, and then all the way to 2019. So, you know, these case studies shows that actually at a geographical level, or territorial level, this has quite a big impact on the land mass and actually how the land is used for communities, villages, and towns and cities around these places. Obviously, it's not always rivers and lakes, but also in the sea. I'll use Matsu Island, located north of mainland Taiwan. Highlighted at the top is on the map, and it's quite close to China, and it consists of seven islands, and due to the necessity of sand internationally, dredgers are entering into the coastline and illegally sand mining. So just to show you visually, in 2017, two vessels were spotted, then in 2018, 71 vessels were spotted, and then 600 in 2019, and close to 4,000 dredgers was spotted in 2020. So it's quite, again, I'm trying to make, I'm trying to always trying to make it a bit visual so you can see how actually the scale of what is happening. And this again means seabed is completely destroyed around the island and fishing is the main source of income for many around this island, which resulted to res uh, residents being forced to relocate back into the mainland Taiwan and take up alternative occupations. So this is a satellite image taken on October the 25th, showing 225 vessels. Um, I've kind of circled it, but hopefully you can see that, um, within the six kilometer zone. So you can see how quite horrific this image is in terms of how much sand they could be uh, extracting on a daily basis. The Mekong River is notoriously a well-known river that sand is extracted. And what is it, kind of unique is it's, it's extracted cross borders. So as you can see, the river runs through Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, and into China. And it provides water for households and agricultural needs provides hydroelectric power, and obviously it provides infrastructure and transportation to towns and villages and communities along this 5,000 kilometer stretch. However, due to the lack, or you could say none at all, in terms of regulations and policies, or monitoring of these activities, has allowed illegal sand mining to tear up riverbeds and edges along the Mekong, where the consequences have radically changed the way you live, the way you work, and you know, essentially the kind of livelihood of these people who live around this river. And unfortunately, many of these consequences and implication affects the everyday people, like farmers, and especially in relation to the context of Mekong River, um, rice farmers. 
So along the Mekong, it is an estimate to provide irrigation to rice fields that accounts to close to 44% of rice produced in Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos as essentially because it's landlocked. It impacts the fishermen who live along the, the river, and obviously their livelihood depends on the environment to help them make a living. Meaning the risk of sporadic floods that could take one's life, and also on the polar opposite, you know, droughts. And th this is quite life-threatening for the majority of people who essentially uses these material to make a living. So the scale of the extraction operation can vary quite a lot. So you can have government-funded 50-meter dredges that rips the seabed and vacuums the sand. Uh, and then they, you know, it's relocated to make new islands here and made, uh, to make buildings, et cetera. And you have smaller scale dredges and vessels for areas that are more shallower. And obviously, they are able to op operate discreetly and run away from uh, safeguards. And you have even smaller operations using digging boats with vacuum-like devices to literally suck up the sand again. And most simple, yet most dangerous methodology, which is most prevalent in India, is when individuals are literally deep diving into the river or sea or lake and scooping up sand with buckets. And still yet, mining at this scale is proportionally better paid than other labor intensive jobs um, in this kind of area. It does have a high economic return, which is exactly why in India there's a steep rise in what they call sand mafias, which is essentially kind of like brokers or gangs or mafias which bribe blackmail and at times kill to get their hands on sand. And they would obviously go to remote villages and then they literally start digging up the sand and stealing it by force. And the sand extracted in these kind of locations are then sold to builders, contractors, and developers who turn a blind eye. So obviously they can reduce their construction costs and reduce, um, I guess, reduce costs to gain profits. So here is the statistics of death related to sand mining in India from 2019 to 2020, so only one year. And if you look at these three columns, you can see a total of 49 civilians, farmers, reporters, government officials who was killed due to links to illegal sand mining. And unlike water and oil and coal extraction, sand still seems to be quite under the radar. The ease of extraction, both physically and economically, has nurtured a legal practice in the global south, where there's very limited policies to control or regulate anything. And it's, it's very concerning. But at the same time, it still happens in first world nations, where you have CEO of United Airlines being fined for $24,000 for stealing sand from a public beach in Florida, Miami, to create his protective dune in front of his $6.8 million house. So, you know, although I'm talking a lot about the global south, because, um, but this still does happen in first world countries. However, there is more kind of policies to regulate this at a, that is more, I guess, uh, more controlled. And in a way, we must not forget that in some countries, regions, and industries have obviously contributed to the pollution and climate change much more than others. Industrialized and post-industrialized societies like UK have proportionally produced more emissions and used more resources than developing countries. Yet, unfortunately, as I'm, I kind of mentioned, the implications of these operations affect the working class, the indigenous communities who do not have the financial freedom to mitigate future risks compared to the well-off like David, David Beckham. So I had an opportunity to visit this residential tower uh, by Zaha Hadid. And in the top floor, uh, David Beckham bought it. Um, and obviously, it's a penthouse, so it's kind of the whole entire floor. And it comes with a pool, a gym, a spa, massage area, and its own helipad. So super luxurious. And Miami, being a coastal city, means it is at a high risk of sea level rising. 
and it's predicted to be close to 18 inches higher by 2040. So you would probably think twice about buying a $24 million penthouse. But with economic freedom, the Beckhams are always able to relocate to a different city or a different region or a different country um, if need be. But obviously for many, there is no freedom to just buy a lab. There is no freedom to just buy uh, another building in another country or region. So we should and must think about international laws, how to establish robust governance, and how can we regulate, and how can we ensure accountability. And obviously this is no easy task. I don't think I have the answer, but the presentation here today is to generate more awareness of the scarcity of sand, how it has a spatial and architectural implication, and how the construction industry is thriving on this resource that will endanger kind of my life, your life, your children's life, and our grandchildren's life, essentially. So I think I've been quite negative so far, so I'm going to talk about something positive. <laughs> there has been steep development by institutions, NGOs, and startups to promote and develop sustainable practices. For example, adopting lower impact mining techniques and using sustainable materials and recycling materials. And here up on the screen, you can see post extraction procedures to ensure sites are returned to its original state. So on the left is 2018, which is before, and then on the right is 2022. And you can see actually sites can be repaired. Here an Australian firm, Horizon, which specializes in mine repair. And what they do is quite kind of fantastic. They use special products to help increase the growth of natural topsoil and established vegetation. And this usually takes around three to five years uh, to grow what essentially is kind of a bit of a, a lawn. And obviously I think it's a, it's a kind of a, uh, a decade kind of process. And as you can imagine, it's, it's extremely, extremely expensive. However, now in Australia, post extraction, companies are legally bounded to economically finance and manage the recovery of this extracted site. And this is the same when repairing rivers. As you can see from the before and after, it takes incredibly long time to reinstate to its original conditions. Initially starting with the creating of a retaining wall, planting around the edges, and designing wetlands to essentially help filter the pollution. And to get the biodiversity back to its natural life cycle takes well over a decade. And this, of course, is with a series of long-term interventions and finance which makes it almost impossible for many locations as sand extraction along the river or lakes or sea usually and commonly is done illegally. So it's quite hard to pin down accountability and you know, extract finance from gangsters and mafias. In terms of material development, there has been advancements to reduce the need to generate more concrete. For example, on the screen here, you can see what they call is self healing concrete. So it has a capacity to repair itself, which has great potential to reduce pollution and cost for, I think in general, because more concrete obviously produces more waste. And this particular kind of concrete is more for maintenance and repair use. So not actually trying to build buildings, but for repair. And for example, majority of the infrastructure in Japan was built in the early 50s and 60s. And it's deteriorating at a rapid pace. And a country with many earthquakes, um, which obviously means that the concrete cracks, kind of splits and fragments it, and it obviously needs to be repaired. And if you consider this at a national scale, um, it's quite a lot of repairing. So self-healing concrete can prove to be quite useful in this setting. Other materials being explored is using ore sand by repurposing sand-like materials from mine waste. So essentially using something that they would throw away, so something that's completely useless into something that is useful. And maybe most interesting, because with a bit more time, it becomes quite realistic because it would probably be commercially viable very soon, which is what the research group from Imperial College of London is developing, which is concrete that is made from desert sand. So as mentioned, desert sand is too fine. So it, it doesn't obviously bind together, as I mentioned. 
but the group has developed a binder agent or ingredient that allows desert sand to create concrete at the same strength as a typical concrete and have only half the carbon footprint. So I think there are many ways that we can try to deal with this condition and there will probably be a lot more creative ways to compact, combat these problems. But sometimes it's quite hard for us to imagine how this directly impacts us uh, because it's very slow. And sometimes you can't even see that it's happening. And then 10 years down the line, you kind of notice that uh, things are getting expensive, et cetera. So just so I can paint you a picture, so it's at the back of your mind. The next holiday you book, you know, whether it's uh, Caribbean, you know, Maldives or Italy or somewhere with a nice beach and you get there and there's no beach. I, I think we can all agree that we should try to uh, prevent this. So finally, I would like to finish the presentation zooming out a bit, which is framing it around carbon footprint. Um, and we use this word a lot, I think, these days. Um, but I, I, thought, I thought it was kind of nice to kind of end with this. Um, and it was first used in a BBC magazine in 1999. However, the broader idea and concept regarding environmental footprint have been used since the, kind of at least the 60s. And in 1971, an ad, a kind of US ad went viral, depicting a Native American Indian man shedding tears because his world was polluted by trash, plastic bottles, and rubbish. And this ad, kind of won many awards, and the catch line or catch phrase they were trying to promote was, people start pollution, people can stop it. And what this was trying to do was suggesting that it is an individual issue, that there's plastic waste everywhere. What's lesser known is that the nonprofit group Keep America Beautiful, who directed this very ad, is funded by the beverage and packaging company pumping out the billions of plastic bottles each year. The likes of Coca-Cola and Pepsi and many more. And obviously it was a marketing strategy to manipulate the responsibility to the consumer. In 2005, advertisement company Ogilvy worked with BP to popularize and promote that climate change is not the fault of an oil giant, but that of individuals. So obviously what they knew is that they knew the future risks of the backlash of the operation, therefore scripted and developed a story to place responsibility on the individual consumer by developing its own carbon footprint calculator in 2005. And we see this carbon footprint calculator a lot these days, but making it in 2005 was quite radical. And you know, it, it does essentially the same thing. You can calculate your normal daily life, how much you, you know, what you do for work, buying food, traveling, and basically all that is kind of responsible for heating the globe. And by doing this, they strategically assign the responsibility for climate impact to the individual. Also, you know, at the same time, they generate a nice corporate image that they seem to be appearing to do something about it. So in the UK, the support of Ogilvy ran ads again, asking Londoners, to, and asking questions like, do you worry about climate change? What size is your carbon footprint? Ah, the carbon footprint, the... No, 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 no. Whatever it is, the whole population will make that a very, very big number. How much carbon is in my produce? Is that it? You mean the effect that my living has on the Earth in terms of the products I consume? So as you can see, people naturally replied with I or we when responding to this quite weighty question about global warming. And what this allowed BP to do was to linguistically remove itself as a contributor and by forcing the people being interviewed, by them saying I or we, it became a very much an individual problem. So obviously I think instead of shifting responsibility to the individual and taxing consumption, which is us, this should be placed on production. For example, 
uh, in the sugar tax in the UK, what could have been a quite a radical policy to tax companies. However, the downfall or shortfall of this very policy was that companies could easily brush off and cost to be offloaded to the consumers. Now you can buy decarbonized, carbon neutral, with its own climate scores. But obviously the cost to decarbonize these products is solely placed on the consumer. We can now offset the carbon by paying additional when buying plane tickets. So I think we've all seen this, so that the aviation industry can offload costs to help fund their transition away from the reliance of polluting fossil fuels to clean energy. Again, the responsibility is completely and purely on the individual consumer, which is me and you. And Matt Gorman, the cha chair of sustainable aviation and senior Heathrow executive publicly stated, as an industry, we have always supported the idea that polluter pays. Ultimately, passengers should pay the carbon cost of travel, which completely kind of indicates that there's no fault on the corporation side and only fault on the consumer. And what's always concerning is that the voices and strategies are coming from the very corporations that is practicing the cause of the issue itself. So it's almost, or at least I believe it's almost a given that it's not possible to change consumer patterns. We have all been spoiled to death with the convenience and benefits, whilst the system that essentially taxes the consumer is only impacting lower income individuals and families who are already struggling, creating further social gap. So there needs to be radical change in the way we use resources. And in order to do this, it's not kind of making it slightly difficult for consumers to buy these products, but hitting obviously the production line. And I don't think obviously by just doing that, it will solve the problem. But I think as what I'm trying to promote here is not that we stop using uh, resources that we stop you know flying or whatever but it's about balance how can we balance this and the balance between production and our environment meaning using less sand which means we can all enjoy a beach holiday thank you thank you very much Ed. would you take some questions Yep, yes. Yes, Neil. <laughs> um, just looking at the sunny side of Australia, the big deep wells that they're making in the mining, do you know how they actually fill that deep well in so quickly? Because I noticed they were spraying that sort of substrate on yeah, to get so, things growing. Um, with those, they usually use desert sand. So obviously you can't construct with desert sand, but you can use desert sand to fill these holes. So obviously Australia, uh, you know, a lot of the, <laughs> the land is desert. So what they do is they relocate some of the deserts. And what they do is obviously not steal it or not, not take it from one location, but they spread it out. So it's kind of managed on a national scale and also on a state level. Um, so obviously it's not to kind of like hinder and uh, kind of impact one specific location, but so it's spread out, essentially. Yeah, I was wondering if it's sort of, it's taken, it's not really doing any good in some respects, it's just relocating circles. Yeah, it is, it essentially is. But I guess, I guess Australia can do it is because I think, you know, um, I think almost like 75% of the land is kind of desert. Um, don't quote me, I don't know 100%, but I remember last time I checked, which was like six years ago, that was the case. <laughs> Thank you, Sha. That was a really fantastic lecture. Um, I've got two questions. And can, will I be able to remember them long enough to say what they are? The first one is to do with, you, you know that you showed a slide of the, the seriously dry sand that surrounds Dubai, mm -hmm. that part of the world. I, I, I mean, presumably there are some smart people who are trying to think about how we can wet that up a bit, make it uh, mineable. 
that's the, and maybe maybe there are, maybe there aren't. But that's the first question. <laughs> then I suppose the other question is, it's, it's uh, on on those those lovely sections that you showed of um, the Yangtze River slowly becoming broader and broader and broader, so that it's no longer a river, it's a lake, and then it's a, in an inner sea. All, where does all the water that fills it come from? Okay, so... So, so I, those are two very technical questions. Yes. So I guess the first question is, I, I guess what the Imperial College group is trying to do is trying to use that desert sand. And um, maybe in future, I, I, I don't think by just wetting the sand in the desert will be enough to actually make the actual particles coarse enough. So that's what the group is doing. They're making a binder agent. So they can't really change the kind of molecule type of sands, but what they can do is try to create an agent that allows for even very soft, smooth desert sand to be stuck. So um, they're saying at least five, six more years, it will be commercially viable. Right now, it is still possible, but it, it doesn't work at a, a scale in terms of building. And uh, the second question is, where does the water come from? Uh, I think the you know actually uh, the water does come from obviously the mountain tops. So obviously it comes down and kind of goes into the lake. But I, I think what's happening is obviously when they're dredging the sand along the kind of edges, uh, the the capacity of the water changes and also it inflicts kind of butterfly implications. And then where the water was streaming down into the lake is kind of diversified and sometimes it goes to different areas. That's why, in a way, the water um, capacity reduces. And obviously, this has kind of implications on a butterfly effect of fishes and birds and essentially how it might be used to irrigate the kind of agricultural land around the lake. So I did that. I'm not sure if that answered your question properly. but Do you know? Uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's, it's more for everyone, for everyone to hear. Yeah. Um, do you know of ways of sort of when a building has reached its, the end of its life of recycling that sort of concrete and cement, turning it back into sort of usable construction material, mm. like a sand-like, which then gets mixed back into concrete and yeah. sort of recycled so you're not mining new sand all the time, but the recycling yeah. used? Unfortunately, a lot of the times the, the concrete is not kind of recyclable. Um, it, there's only small portions of it, so it takes actually more cost to go through the rubble and control the deconstruction to use and recycle. That's why, in general, it, it doesn't get recycled, and it's just far more easier just building it from top. So just like with anything, I think if the economics balances out, more people will be prone of recycling because it outweighs maybe cost or time. Um, but I think these are the kind of things that would be nice because what I'm trying to do actually in this kind of presentation is generate awareness. And by the time you students and some professionals here go out and you know, designs buildings, bridges, infrastructures, that you're conscious about how you can actually potentially propose a way of recycling or reducing the material. And I don't, I'm not advocating like, you know, don't build, but I think you know, build smart. You know. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Actually, it suits both of our projects because we're looking at sediment in our studio. I'm just wondering if you've ever seen a video of um, these people who basically collected all glass bottles, crushed them down, and tried to build salt marshes using glass because they're sort of trying to go backwards mm -hmm. in time to convert glass into sand. And I'm just wondering what you think of that. I'm, I'm, I mean, I haven't provided enough information, but essentially what they've done is, yeah. is crushed glass and try to sort of go backwards a step to try to rebuild, I guess, reconstruct sand so mm. it becomes a usable sort of product to create something like salt marshes. Because I've seen, you know, they've used hair to collect oils from yeah. salt marshes, stuff like that. So what do you think about these 
sort of like niche products that are trying to tackle a bigger problem, but they essentially probably use a lot more energy to crush the glass and uh, to collect hair and to process yeah. it and all of those other products because they've done that so many times with even like three D printing, um, you know, uh, I guess like uh, stuff to put under the sea and stuff like that. So, what do you think about these? Uh, people or companies that try to create these niche products and do you ever see that actually becoming something that is viable or is it more for uh, views and TikToks? Um, no, I, obviously as you mentioned there's so many different people trying to use different products and it will always be not viable at the start I think you know it, it just doesn't work out as you said it takes more energy it takes more effort crushing it um, and I think in general, I think everyone, everyone kind of knows that, that it's not really viable at that scale. But obviously, unless you start something, you know, unless you kind of develop it five years, ten years later, that's, I think, when it becomes kind of viable in terms of scalability. Um, because if we stop everything in terms of if it's providing product, uh, uh, providing uh, enough kind of what you need it to do, to do at this point right now, then everyone would be doing it. So I think it, there is a beauty and there, there's importance that people are actually developing and trying to do different things, even though it might not seem like it works out right now. Um, and I, uh, you know, the, the example I showed you was, you know, they started doing it like about six, seven years ago, and it, it does take that long time to actually develop materials that is scalable and economically kind of like capable of being used in the construction industry. So personally, I don't think it's, um, uh, it's yeah, it's, it's something that could actually be developed in kind of academic setting, doing it in very small scale, and in a way having an educated prediction that in 10 years time with the technology, with enough kind of support, finance, actually it can be something that is scalable. So that's why I think actually, you know, some of the things that my students were doing last year and two years ago, you know, although in an academic setting, you know, it, 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 it's still academic, but then there are moments that are scalable. So, you know, I think there's a kind of beauty in doing that in whichever unit you're in. I'm sorry, I don't know which one you're in. But. And masters. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I've got to, I have a question um, from, we have an online audience of, oh. of yeah, millions. <laughs> um, so this is from Scott Batty, we happen to know, so that's good. Um, does this situation lead to timber being the best no sand, lowest carbon construction solution? Um, I've said this to so many of my students. I'm not anti-concrete. If anything, I'm very pro-concrete. Um, I think it's, it depends on, obviously, the condition. Because you can have um, timber that's sourced all the way from Germany, and then it comes all the way on a boat, and et cetera. And actually, if you calculate all that in terms of carbon footprint, it can be a lot than you know, actually building uh, a structure out of recycled steel that you kind of get from down the street. So I think. The, the kind of blanket answer of using timber is always great. I personally is, uh, I'm not a big fan of, but if you are positioning yourself in terms of like if timber is the best, where do you source it, how do you maintain it, and how do you actually calculate it is kind of important. So I, I personally wouldn't just say, okay, timber is the kind of go-to material, but if anything in academia, I would love to see students using concrete, but using it very smartly and creatively. Um, there's lots of kind of um, methods to reduce the slab um, thickness by using a kind of, uh, I guess, a vaulted system so you can re really reduce the concrete mass. So I think there's different design and technical kind of challenges that might help to reduce concrete than saying, okay, let's just use timber because obviously it's a natural material so everyone's happy. But um, I, I think there's something to kind of question about that. Hi, thank you for an amazing lecture. Um, you mentioned several times that sand is the second most extracted material in the world. What is the first one? Uh, it's, it's water. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, uh, maybe I didn't make it clear. Yes, water is. Same back to Neil. Hi, Sherry. Sorry, it's less of a question, but you know on the global population graph, 
it seems like we're hitting the peak pretty soon, or we're almost there. What are the predictions for further on? Is it like this sudden jump on no one really knows? Because it obviously can't, it's like bacteria growing. <laughs> We've gone exponentially up, we've hit the peak, it should be going down. And it's not really a question for you, but yeah. something to think about. Well, is this all impacting on our own lives in the sense of our health and everything? And does the population stop you know, decreasing because mm. of all these factors? Yeah, obviously, you know, I'm not a specialist in kind of population and demographic, but, you know, my best get is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ethnically Japanese, and obviously our population growth is reducing a lot per year. Um, so I, I think potentially there will be some nations, some kind of ethnicity or some areas that will boom and other that will reduce in population because uh, it's just shrinking. So in a way, like Japan is a kind of good example because Tokyo is booming with lots of people, but everything else around that periphery is kind of like reducing like crazy. So in a way, if you scale that into kind of world scale, there will be most probably particular nations, particular areas that have a boom, and then there will be other countries that will probably, uh, I guess, reduce in population, or at least they migrate into one location. Um, but yeah, uh, th that's just my opinion. So um, I w yeah, please don't quote me on that. <laughs> I think it's to do with, I think it's birth rate, I, don't, I think it's not to do with environmental conditions so much, but anyway. Um, look, th that was a fantastic presentation, and thanks so much. And I, I, Gabriel asked a question, that I, which was about turning stuff into concrete, and, and can you turn it, you know, is that a one trick? We're told that's irreversible, but of mm. course, it, I don't, it sort of isn't, actually, you could probably get the sand out eventually. So mm. um, so maybe we're just moving all this stuff around. I just think it's a very important message, which is to think about what we make things out of. And that is that is the agency that designers have to make those decisions, and for, for good reasons, technical reasons, or social reasons, ecological, social, you know, all those things. I think that's, so that, and that comes across very strongly in your talk. So thanks very much for that. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice evening. <laughs>